Hi everyone and welcome to Solarization 6. So, thanks to 2K and Firaxis, I am able to show you the first few hours of Solarization 6. Now, before we go any further, a quick disclaimer. Any gameplay values you will see in this game are subject to change until close to launch. So, don't get too attached to that. Also, everything I do here is post-commentary, because this was recorded at an event that I was invited to, and obviously I was not able to provide live commentary while playing there. So this is all post-commentary, and we will be playing as Pedro. So one of the reasons why I picked Brazil is because of their unique ability, which improves districts when they are built next to rainforest tiles. They get plus one adjacency bonus for campus, commercial hub, holy site and theater square from rainforest tiles. And these four districts are basically districts for science, gold, faith and culture. And rainforest tiles also provide plus one housing for neighborhoods built adjacent to them. So that's a pretty nice unique ability for districts. And they also get a unique district, the street carnival. But we'll talk about that once we actually build it in-game. It basically helps with the new happiness mechanics in the game. It's not actually called happiness anymore, but you'll see once we actually get there. In any case, they get a unique district. Other than that, they also get a unique ability that refunds 20% of great person cost when you recruit or patronize a great person. Great people work quite a bit differently in Civilization 6. You actually compete for the same great people with other Civilizations, which is really interesting. One final note before we get started. I unfortunately had to mute the audio, because I didn't check whether the game options menu was fully functional and whether it was possible to turn off the music. I know it kind of sucks, but it is what it is. All right, let's get started then, shall we? The one thing I really have to say before we get further into the game is that this was a time-limited event and there were so many things that I wanted to check out about the game and experiment with and obviously it was just completely impossible to do all of that in one single game. And there were no readers. Like, this was one shot that I had at it. Having said that, I had a list of things that I wanted to see or check out in this game, and I managed to do most of them. So, this is our starting location. You still start with a settler and with a warrior, as you can clearly see. And here's city management. You can still lock tiles manually, and I will be playing around with that a little bit here. Or you can leave the city on default management by the AI. It will likely be optimal to manually manage all the tiles, especially on higher difficulty levels, but I will mostly not be doing that in this game, because that takes time, and time wasn't something that I had in abundance. <laughs> because again, this was time limited. As in, the game wasn't, but the event was. Other than that, you are about to see the tech tree. And here is the tech tree. I will have a separate video where I will be showing the tech tree. So if you are interested in that, it will be in the description below probably, once I actually publish it on the channel. But here's all our available research at the start of the game, and if you're not familiar with the boost mechanic, every single tech, other than the three initial ones, pottery, animal husbandry and mining, every single tech has a Eureka mechanic, which means that if you do a specific thing in-game, you will get a boost to that tech. And that boost is worth quite a lot. It makes research way faster. And every single tech in the game has these boosts. Some of them are things that you will do kind of naturally while playing the game, and others you need to go out of your way. And a lot of them you will actually have to plan. As for our research here, I decided to go for pottery. But yeah, these Eureka moments are actually very interesting, because you will have to plan around them. Because if you actually get to the point where you can research a tech, and you still don't have the boost, that's kind of too late to get it. If it's a tech that's really important for you, and you have to get it right now, that you have to prioritize it, it doesn't make any sense to wait to get that boost, because if it takes you, let's say, 10 turns, 
and you save five turns by getting that Eureka boost? That doesn't make any sense, you just wasted time. Assuming that was a technology that's a priority. If it's a technology that can wait, you can obviously postpone it a bit, but if it's a tech that you are beelining, and you have to get it as soon as possible, for example for a timing attack, if it's a military tech, then you really have to plan these boosts in advance. Because a lot of them are not things that will happen naturally. You can't just play normally and get all of these boosts. You have to plan your game around them. Which will make for some pretty interesting strategies, at least that's how I feel. You will have to plan your strategy around these things. Because these boosts are really significant, they will save you a ton of science. So anyway, here's me exploring. I did try to explore as much as possible. And I am playing on a Pangea map. Now here's one interesting thing. There's a continent mechanic in the game, and Pangea isn't one continent. So if I hover over some of these tiles for a little bit longer, you will see the actual continent name. And here's me meeting my first neighbor. On turn 5? That was pretty quick. And that's Monty, as you can see. And Monty's agenda, because every Civ has an agenda, had to do with luxuries. He wants to have all the luxuries for himself, and from what I remember, he will be happy if you have the same luxuries that he does, and he will dislike you if you get luxuries that he doesn't have access to. I will show it very briefly on a diplomatic screen later, but that's his agenda. And every Civ in the game also starts with one random agenda, a hidden one, which you don't know what it is. And here's me playing around with the city a little bit more, but like I said, I will mostly not be locking these tiles manually, I just wanted to check how locking tiles actually works in the game interface, and that's how it works right there. Anyway, Monty is pretty damn close to us, and that will make for some interesting diplomacy later on. I don't want to spoil what actually happens in the game, but let's just say one of my goals for this game is to check out combat and siege mechanics. That was one of the specific goals that I had for this preview event. I wanted to check out combat and siege mechanics. So I'll leave you with that. <laughs> anyway, our next research is going to be writing because we got a boost because we met our neighbor. So we will be researching writing next. And you can already see that it saved us four turns, which is almost 50%. It brought the research time down from 10 to 6 turns. So it's obviously something that you will have to plan around. It's a large part of planning your research. And it will be pretty much crucial on higher difficulty levels. That's how I feel. And here's us going into diplomacy. Now, you normally get some gossip from saves, but you need to play the game a bit to actually get any feedback. And the gossip window tells you what that sieve is doing. You can get more gossip if you send caravans or trade routes to that sieve's cities, for example. And one of the sieves in the game actually gets a unique ability that gives them more gossip, that's France. Anyway, we got a lot of bananas around here. And I assume Brazil has a rainforest start by us, seeing how that's what they had jungle start by us in Civ 5, and seeing how their unique ability pretty much requires rainforest. So yeah, that's almost definitely the case. And here's another Eureka boost that we got for foreign trade. So that's a civic research, if you can call it research, I suppose, because there is a whole second quote-unquote research tree, which is civics. Again, I will also have a video that will show the civic tree, but that will be a completely separate video. I didn't want to include that in this one. And here's our first civic completed. Which means we can change our policies, and policies is another new mechanic in Civ 5, which lets you use the policies that you unlock through the Civic Tree. Policies are basically various bonuses that you can activate, 
And as you can see, we can activate one military policy and one economic policy. There are dozens and dozens of policies in the game that you unlock through the civic tree. And some of them synergize with each other. There are a lot of different combinations, especially later on. And here's the civic tree. So early on, I was trying to prioritize getting a civic that unlocks governments. You'll see how that works later on. In this case, I will pick foreign trade because we just got a boost for that. And that saved us almost half the time required to actually complete that. It brought it down from seven turns to four turns. So that's what we'll go with. Okay. And we will continue to explore. Now, one of the things that I did later on was recruit as many different units as possible. So you will get to see quite a few different units. Having said that, because this was a turn limited build and I was time limited, I didn't get even remotely close to the end of the game. And this build was limited so that it wasn't possible to get to the end of the game. But I didn't even get close to the actual end of the build that I was playing. But I did get to discover a lot of things that I wanted to discover. And we found a barbarian camp over here. Now, barbarians are quite a bit tougher to kill than barbarians in Civ 5. Some of them are actually quite tough. And sometimes you need to send multiple units to kill a barbarian camp. Also, there are huts on the map, but they are actually kind of easy to miss at times. They are definitely less obvious than in Civ 5. There's one on the left or to the north of Rio, right there that you can see. I will pick it up later from what I remember. And there's quite a lot of wheat to the north of Rio. It's a pretty nice spot. There are already multiple nice spots for cities around us. And here's writing. And next we will go for animal husbandry. And yeah, like I mentioned earlier, a Pangaea map isn't actually a single continent. It will be divided into various different continents. I don't think I will hover over any of these tiles long enough. But it's important because, yeah, as you saw a moment ago, this is Atlantica continent, but this will not be the entire Pangaea. And this is important because some mechanics in the game actually kind of work with continents. So, for example, some of the agendas have to do with continents. If you are on the same continent or do things within the same continent some specific sieve is on, other things happen. So it's kind of worth keeping in mind that Pangaea isn't one single continent in terms of game mechanics. I also have to say that I actually really liked the visual presentation of the game and it's not about the graphics, but about the fact that I never once had any kind of doubt what I'm actually looking at. The way the game looks makes it really obvious what you are looking at. And that's very important for me, at least, in strategy games. So that's the part I really enjoyed about this. And here's the civic tree again. And as you can see, I was already in a situation where I had to pick something I didn't have a Eureka boost for. We did not improve three tiles yet because I just got my first builder. We didn't found the Pantheon and we didn't grow our civilization to at least 6 population. And this is only turn 14. So, yeah. Anyway, we are going to build... What are we going to build? Yeah, I was just checking the cost of actually buying a unit outright. We would be able to buy a Slinger for 90 gold already. If we were being threatened by barbarians or something similar. And do notice how units are actually relatively pretty cheap. However, we are playing on a quick speed here, because this was actually the only setting I could have played on. It was not possible to use any other game setting for this. So you should also keep it in mind when it comes to game pacing. If you see things that are very cheap, then do keep in mind that this is on quick speed. So it will be slower on standard. So it will not take three turns to build a slinger on standard, which is what most people play at. Anyway, here's the builder. 
and I will be building a few farms because I cannot improve the ivory just yet. Now, as you might or might not know, builders are not quite like workers in previous civilization games. All builders have a limited number of charges and they complete their tasks instantly. And here you can see that we have no luxuries that Monty wants, so he's not too upset at us. That's his agenda, basically. And here's our first slinger. That's a one-tile ranged unit. He has a range of one tile. And we will explore a little bit more. I was actually quite surprised to meet Monty this early. It was turn 5. He did start really damn close. And we will grab another slinger. Because you really do want to have some defenses. If you leave your sieve completely defenseless in the early game, it's very likely that someone will declare war on you. In fact, wars in the early game with sieve 6 mechanics will be more common than in previous sieve games. At least that's kind of how I feel. Especially the way diplomacy is set up in sieve 6. Diplomacy will be very basic early on, so surprise wars and wards in general will be almost like a default state. If someone gets upset at you, he will just declare war. And with Monty, it's pretty damn easy to upset him. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about. He is upset because we have a luxury that he wants. And it's pretty damn easy to upset your neighbors with their agendas. Not to mention, every sieve in sieve 6 gets a random hidden agenda which is randomized for every single game, and you do not know what that agenda is. So you definitely want some defenses early on. And this is a fairly low difficulty, this is Prince, because it was the only difficult level that was available for this build. My point is, you definitely don't want to leave your sieve defenseless, <laughs> because yeah, you might be in trouble if you do that. And here I will be checking out some of the resources, so that was Jade. Here's cattle, which is a bonus resource. And I will hover over most of these resources. There was rice over there. Stone, wheat. These are bonus resources. Bananas, wheat. We got deer. We got sheep, stone, ivory. And crab, bonus resource. There aren't a whole lot of luxuries over here. And we got copper over there. And in general, this is just my observation based on one game, so it might not be 100% accurate because, you know, my sample size is kind of small. However, I feel like both luxuries and strategic resources are significantly more rare in Civ 6. Once I get the text that reveal strategic resources on the map, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Strategic resources seem to be very rare. Which also means they will be that much more important. And there are some new ones, there are some old ones, and the same goes for luxuries. Luxuries seem to be more rare. I'm not as confident about that as with strategic resources, but strategic resources are almost definitely more rare than they were in C5. And here's the city state. So, as you might or might not know, city states also work completely differently in Civ 6, or at least very differently. You now send envoys, which you can get through quests, like right here we have a quest to construct an encampment district, which we are not able to do just yet. And the way that works is that you get scaling bonuses, you get different tiers of bonuses, depending on how many envoys you send to various city-states. And you can decide that yourself. You also get some kind of for free, quote-unquote, by completing these quests. And there are also some unique bonuses to specific city-states. In general, it's a more complex system than previously. And here we got another boost. And there's also quite a bit of planning in involved. You have to decide which city-states you want to prioritize. But you will get to have some city-state bonuses, because in C5, and here's me trading my Avery away. Because in C5, 
it's quite possible to go for a pretty long time without getting any city-state bonuses at all. If you don't get any easy-to-complete city-state quests, if you don't get every convenient start for city-states and so on, it's quite possible to just go for a pretty long time without any city-state bonuses. Here, it's much easier to get city-state bonuses. But it's definitely something you have to pay attention to and plan around. Just something to keep in mind. I actually quite like city-state changes. I didn't get to play too far into the game, so it's kind of hard for me to judge city-states for the mid-game and late-game, but yeah, I do like the changes. And there was another boost just a moment ago. And Monty is suspiciously close to our border. I was actually looking at his unit a lot over there. And I can't quite tell if it means he plans to actually do something or he's just chilling close to our city. He was upset earlier, so I kind of assumed that he might decide to attack me at some point. And here's mining. And there are a lot of techs that we can already research. And not a lot of boosts, as you can see. I pretty much have to pick something that I didn't have a boost for. So I was thinking about what exactly we're going to grab. And we went for irrigation. And here's me killing some barbarians. That guy is actually tougher. Because that's a spearman. And yet another city-state. Quite a lot of city-states around. No second AI yet, however. It took me quite a bit of time to make contact with the second sieve. But we will get the second sieve and more. Don't worry about that. That is coming. And I did explore quite a bit more than this. Not the entire Pangea, however. So, we are about to kill that barbarian spearman which I think will result in a promotion. He's going down. But it did take two units to actually get rid of that barbarian camp. He's actually not dead yet. Okay then, <laughs> I think he's at like one health. We can kill him now. There, now he's dead for real. And we got 50 gold from that. And we also got a Eureka boost. That was one of the reasons why I was going for that camp, other than wanting to get rid of barbarians in close proximity of my capital. And here's yet another city-state, La Venta. This is already quite a lot of city-states. And my general feeling so far is that city-states will be a more important part of the game and of your strategy than they were in Civilization V. But that's just my general feeling, based on how much I played. Here we're killing some more barbarians. And we got yet another promotion. And here's the promotion. We got Volley, and we got Garrison. And yet another Slinger. Still no second civilization, just Monty, who we made contact with on, what, turn 5? That was a very, very early contact. And we got another barbarian to the east, a barbarian slinger, this time around. Which probably means there's a barbarian camp to the east. And you actually want to have barbarians nearby at the start, at least a few, because there are quite a few Eureka boasts that are tied to barbarians, and killing barbarians. So you do not want to avoid them completely. And here we got another Eureka bonus, exactly what I was talking about. It's from barbarians. And that's a pretty useful one though, for bronze working. Especially if your early strategy involves warmongering. Speaking of early game strategies, I obviously only really played one game, but I already feel that there will be a lot of valid early game strategies in Civ 6. 
more than in Civ 5, especially on higher difficulty levels. But we'll see about that. There are definitely way more decisions that you have to make in the early game. There are so many decisions that you have to make in Civ 6. Which definitely means there will be more than one or two valid paths. That's one of the things that I'm looking forward to the most. There's so much that you can do differently. And here we can pick a Pantheon, which we are going to do in just a moment. There are some old Pantheons and there are some new Pantheons. Some of the old Pantheons have new mechanics, like for example Desert Folklore. It's still a faith from deserts, but it works slightly differently. It now gives Holy Site Districts plus some faith from adjacent desert tiles. Here's me just looking through all these Pantheons real quick. So I won't be discussing every single Pantheon right now, but you can see all of them right there. Just keep in mind what I said at the start of this video, that any gameplay values that you see at any point of this game are subject to change before release. So just something to keep in mind. And this was actually a pretty tough decision which Pantheon to pick because there was no obvious choice. There really wasn't. So I actually spent quite a bit thinking about which exact Pantheon to go for. Divine Spark is a pretty interesting one. I actually quite like that one because it gives you more great person points. And as I mentioned at the start of the game, you actually compete for the same great people now. So it's a more competitive mechanic in Civilization VI, which makes it a pretty good pantheon actually. Especially for a Civ like Brazil, which has a great people focused unique ability. As a side note, I really don't like these units Monty is keeping close to our capital. <laughs> and back to the pantheon, I was considering Goddess of the Hunt at this point, because we got three tiles with ivory next to our capital and ivory is improved with camps. So that would be a pretty decent food boost for our capital. And I knew I was time limited, so growing our capital a bit more quickly was not a bad idea. We also got one deer to the north, which is still in range of Rio, and we got another deer to the west, which we can potentially grab with one of our next cities. And here's another inspiration boost, because we founded a pantheon, and now we are going to pick some more production, so a builder. We need some more builders to improve some tiles around Rio, because it's growing quite nicely, it's up to 4 population. And we completed Early Empire, which unlocks two pretty good civics early on. One of them gives you plus 50% production to settlers, and the other one decreases cost of purchasing new tiles. Both really useful early game policies and I will grab the production boost to settlers, because we will be recruiting more settlers. And here's the promotion for melee units, battle cry and tortoise, at least non-mounted melee units. And we will grab battle cry. Alright, and we are going to send our settler west, to settle a city. I was a little bit torn about whether to start a coastal city or just a regular city on one of these jungles or on a hill, but in the end I went for a non-coastal city to take advantage of the district bonus from rainforests. And here we're back in the civics tree, we got Eureka boost for both craftsmanship and mysticism. And mysticism unlocks the oracle. But I decided to go for craftsmanship first. And back to our scout. I probably should have healed the scout back to full at some point. I think I'll do it later. But yes, exploring with a wounded scout was slightly risky. You can usually spot barbarians with a scout if you're careful though. Speaking of barbarians, we got more barbarians incoming. And my units are a little bit too far away to deal with them at the moment. We got the slinger, but the slinger is escorting the settler, so I actually got 
caught kind of off guard. But I can still use my escort slinger. Just need to be more careful with the settler, especially when moving him into the fog. These are pretty weak units that we are getting attacked with, so it's not really a big deal. But I didn't want them to just rampage around our capital. And yes, I decided to heal that scout right there before exploring any further. There has to be yet another barbarian camp somewhere nearby. Speaking of barbarians, here's yet another slinger. So quite a few barbarians around. And that's considering Monty has been right next to me from the start of the game. And here's me moving the settler and we will move him into the tile to the northwest. Because then the way will be blocked by tiles that require two movement. I was considering starting a city, but I decided to go for the tile northwest of me. And that was pretty much the safest move here as well, because there is a barbarian there, but he cannot attack us because the way is blocked by tiles that require two movement, so we were safe. I did send the slinger back because we'll have to get rid of that barbarian camp, and it's a barbarian camp guarded by a spearman. Which means I'll need more than one unit to kill him. In other news, we are about to finish irrigation, which unlocks plantations, and we can get quite a few plantations around here. But it also unlocks the hanging gardens, which is a really nice wonder. I only hovered over it very briefly, but it increases growth by 15% in all your cities. So that is a very good wonder. And we can actually build it, because it has to be built next to a river. But that also means it will likely be a very competitive wonder, because that's not exactly a very hard criteria. Build it next to a river, there are plenty of rivers everywhere. Some of the wonders have very specific requirements that will not be easy to fulfill, which will likely make these wonders less competitive, but the Hanging Gardens is certainly not one of them. <laughs> everyone can get a river, or almost everyone at least. Our next research is going to be Astrology, mostly because it unlocks a shrine and a new district, the Holy Site district. As for production, I think I was just going to grab more units, yep. Because it's pretty obvious at this point that we do need quite a few units, not only to defend ourselves against barbarians, but also against a potential threat from Monty. Not to mention I actually wanted to attack Monty at some point myself, because that was one of my goals for this game, actually go to war, and maybe even conquer a city or two. So I need an army for that. Anyway, we just finished craftsmanship, which unlocked two policies that were quite useful in our situation. One that allows us to recruit builders faster, and the other that allows us to recruit military units faster. So I can definitely use both in my current situation. We actually need quite a lot of improvements around here. We got all these bananas that will require plantations. We still got two tiles with deer, even though one is out of our borders. Not to mention we can also get farms and all these kinds of things. And here's another Eureka moment. That's one of the Eureka moments that's actually kind of hard to get because it requires finding a natural wonder. And this is a new natural wonder, a crater lake, which gives you plus one science, plus four faith, and it acts as a fresh water source, which can be quite useful. There are actually Several new natural wonders, I won't tell you what all of them are because I've not seen all of them, but there are some pretty interesting ones. Unfortunately, this wonder is a little bit too far away to consider settling a city. I will not be settling a city over there, sadly. If it was a little bit closer, then yeah. Also, it's worth noting that natural wonders are actually more valuable in Civilization VI compared to Civilization V, because not only they give you their own yields, they are used for some district adjacency bonuses. Which means even so-called bad natural wonders are useful, way more useful than they were previously. That's one of the things that I actually quite like, one of the many small things that I liked a lot. 
Here's where I wanted to build a district, but I don't have the tech to remove rainforest tiles just yet. But I was checking out the adjacency bonus. And you can see just how good the unique ability for Brazil is. Because this gives us plus one adjacency bonus from each rainforest tile, which means we can get up to plus six for the campus. Plus six is actually huge. And it's really, really tough to get that high of a bonus without something like the Brazil's unique ability. So I actually already like that unique ability a lot. And it's quite flexible because it gives you adjacency bonuses from rainforest tiles to four different district tiles. You can use it to get science, you can use it to get gold, you can use it to get faith or culture. So it's a very, very flexible unique ability. I already like it a lot and I only played this once. And here we unlocked the Holy Site district. And as you could see on the tooltip for a brief moment, Holy Site districts get a major faith bonus for adjacent natural wonders. Which is what I was saying earlier. Natural wonders are more variable in Solization 6. Even bad natural wonders are useful. There is also a four tile natural wonder in the game now, which would actually be kind of insane for Holy Sites and adjacency bonuses. And speaking of unique abilities, I actually kind of feel that unique abilities for leaders in Solization 6 are much more game-defining, and you will really be able to build your strategy around them specifically. Because right now, when you're looking at all these adjacency bonuses that Brazil can get from rainforests, you might be thinking that, wow, that's a really OP unique ability. But thing is, most, if not all, of the other unique abilities that I saw are just as good and can lead to some really unique strategies, especially in case of some of the sieves. So that's actually one of the parts of Civ 6 that I'm really looking forward to. And here's me checking out some of the city-state quests. That's something that you really want to keep an eye on, actually, because a lot of them are pretty easy to complete just through regular gameplay. You just need to be aware of what exactly they are. So for example, build a district or recruit a unit. You can do that very easily. You don't have to go out of your way too much to do these quests. And finishing these quests is actually kind of really important because you do want to take advantage of city-state bonuses. You really do. Anyway, I'm going to make this the end of episode one. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. Subscribe for more Civilization 6 content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.